Great. Welcome to Python Debugging Fundamentals. Um, there um, was a, a URL posted up on the screen earlier for you to download some materials, uh, as well as pass the thumb drive around. Um, at the end, uh, you'll see that URL again. Uh, that URL is also um, in your materials that you got on the, on the thumb drive in the PyOhio 13 folder. Um, so there are several different ways to get the materials for this tutorial. Um, my name is Chris Calloway. I'm from the University of North Carolina Department of Marine Sciences. Um, and I am here uh, as part of PyOhio and a new program of PyOhio um, called PyCamp. PyCamp is a training program devised by my user group, the TriPython user group of the Central North Carolina area, and we take this around to other user groups and help them raise funds for their Python events, uh, as well as for our own, like PyCarolinas. Um, this is a very, very basic, very novice tutorial. So if you've ever done Python debugging before, you are in the wrong place. You will miss two other talks. They'll be very valuable to you. If you've never debugged before, you're probably in the right place. If you've used Python and not debugged, you're probably in the right place. But I don't want to um, uh, have you under any illusions um, that um, I'm going to show you anything here that's rocket science. Everything is going to be very basic in this presentation. Um, and so don't be surprised um, if you're bored and you already know this stuff. Um, so moving right along, um, you can take that zip file that you downloaded or the PyOhio 13 folder. If you've got the zip file, uncompress it and you'll find a PyOhio 13 folder within it. And it has a couple of, um, it has this presentation, has a couple of other folders within it. One is for Python 2 and one is for Python 3. Um, the thing you were asked to do in coming to this tutorial was to have either Python 2.7 or Python 3. You can use whichever you want. I'm going to do this presentation um, Python 3. About the only difference you'll see um, is that in Python 3 in these examples, it's our print functions. And if you're using the Python 2 version of the tutorial, um, the special future module has a feature in Python 2.7 called print under function that when imported will cause your Python program in 2.7 to be able to use the Python 3 print function. The only difference between the Python 2 and the Python 3 directories in your tutorial materials, the Python 2 files, there are three scripts in the, each of those directories. Um, the Python 2 files will import the print function feature from the future module, special future module. Under, under, future, under, under. All right, so if you, if you have that, we'll be using um, examples in the according to your Python, and you want to start up a Python prompt in that folder that you picked so that you can easily run or import those scripts without having to type long paths to them. All right, so how many people um, were in PyCamp this week? Great. I thought I'd see five of you here. I thought I'd see a couple more. I don't know if Dipali and Ishara are coming. All right. So what is debugging in general? Debugging in general is a method for isolating your program errors. Everybody makes mistakes, um, even when they're programming. And um, actually, most often when we're programming, well, there are many pitfalls, many things we could do. And sometimes it can be very difficult to find our mistakes. Python does its best to tell us exactly what file our mistakes are in, what um, particular line um, in our file the, the uh, problem is in, and even what column number the problem is in, what type of problem it is, and very specific, specific information about the problem. But maybe we don't know how we arrived at that problem. Maybe, maybe several steps were involved in getting us to the point where we had a problem. Debugging is what we do at that point. It's a method for isolating program errors. And quite often, um, when we're beginning to learn a programming language or beginning to learn Python, um, we use the print statement or function to print out the values 
uh, bound to various identifiers in our program in order to try to isolate these problems. And that's a perfectly valid way of doing things. However, it may um, be very time consuming. You may have to do it over and over again. You may have to edit your program a lot, and your program ends up with a lot of edits to it that you have to undo or manage or find some way to remove when you finally discovered your error. And there are easy ways of doing this. Uh, if you have to do more than one or two rounds of print statements, you might want to consider what we're going to learn about here today. So normally debugging in Python and most other languages involves executing a program one statement at a time and investigating the state of your namespaces, uh, as well as investigating the state of where your program is in the execution order of your statements. If you can inspect all of these things, you can, along each step of the way, verify for yourself that your program is doing what you expect it to do. And you continue executing your program one statement at a time, inspecting the state of the objects in your programs, and just lather, rinse, and repeat over and over again until you find something going on that is not what you expected. Testing is a matter of having an anticipated result and an actual result and comparing the two. So as you step through your program one statement at a time, you make this comparison. So Python has a module that helps you do this, this part of the standard library of modules built into Python. Of course it does. Python has a standard library module for just about everything that you might, might do or want to do. So we should first always try to see if Python provides a way um, to do something that we would like to do, and most often it does. All right, so in your folder, either the Python 2 or the Python 3 folder, you will find a script called FizzBuzz. We were working on this in PyCamp all week, so if you're in PyCamp, you're well familiar with the FizzBuzz program. It's a very simple, short script that plays an English children's game that's often used in programming examples and candidate interviews for programming jobs. The FizzBuzz children's game consist of circle. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit hoarse today um, because I've been teaching all week, which means I've been standing in front of uh, a, um, a classroom talking about this loud all week. So I, I'm not normally um, this hoarse, uh, so I just have to apologize for that. But um, children sitting around in a circle, um, and like many games where children sit in a circle, the children go around the circle and take turns, each, each child in the circle doing something and then moving on to the next child. And it starts as um, one, one person will start counting at one, and then the next person counts two, and you proceed counting by one around the circle, except for when your number is divisible by three. You would say fizz, and when your number is divisible by five, you would say buzz, and when your number is divisible by three and five, in other words, 15, then you would say fizz buzz. And play proceeds around the circle until someone gets it wrong. Um, and this play can go quite fast because children have learned that games of this nature have a predictable sequence, and therefore it can be gamed. You can start memorizing the fizz buzz sequence. Um, and so it's all dependent at that point about how, how long of a sequence of FizzBuzz numbers you have, or FizzBuzz number answers, that you have memorized. Um, and so we, we have a program in PyCamp that we use to illustrate um, many concepts. Actually, we build it up in PyCamp, and we have various versions of it as we learn new programming techniques, and we arrive at a final answer uh, in one of our projects. And this is one of the final answers, close to the final answer, uh, for the FizzBuzz game. You can run the script answers. Um, but we're going to use this for the purpose of looking at Python's built-in debugger module, PDB, Python Debugger. And one of the things we can do with the Python executable um, that runs Pyth the Python interpreter for us 
is we can use various switches on the command line to turn on Python's features. One of them that's very useful is the dash M switch. And that allows us to run a module that's installed in our Python and standard library modules come pre-installed in Python. Run that module as a script. And most modules when run as a script will do something useful. And then run the PDB module as a script. It expects to have the um, path to a script on the command line so that the Python debugger can help you debug that script. So we have a four-part command line that you are going to run in the folder where your fizzbuzz.py script is. If you're using Python 2, be in the Python 2 folder, the PyOhio 13 folder I, I gave you. Otherwise, if you're using Python 3, be in the Python 3 folder. That way you won't have to tell Python the path to the file it will be in your current working directory. And hopefully your Python executable is also in your system's path. So that when you type Python, you start the correct Python that you think you need. So there at your operating system prompt, that's what the dollar sign stands for. You would start Python by typing Python in lowercase, a space and a dash M. You say, I would like to run a module that's built into this Python. And all Pythons have a built-in PDB module. comes with Python. And then you specify the name of the script that you would like to debug. And we're going to debug fizzbuzz.py today. It doesn't even have to have a bug in it. You can still step through a program one step at a time to learn things about not only your program, but the programs of other developers given to you. So that dash M helps you run the module as a script. PDB loads the PDB module as a script. And then PDB wants the name of a script to debug. Any questions? This is an interactive tutorial. So we expect you to play along. Great. Once we do that, the PDB module will show us several things. You'll see, you should see a console that looks like this. You invoke the script, and there are about three lines after your invocation of PDB with the script to debug. The pieces are, you will see a full path to the script being debugged. You will see the line number of the next statement to execute in the script. And you will see the type of object last evaluated by the script. So when you use PDB to debug a script, that will be module because Python has evaluated your module. It's loaded a module. Actually, it's loaded a PDB module. That's what more what it refers to. Then you see what's called an instruction pointer to the next statement to execute. We're going to step through one at a time, and in the debugger, we'll show you at all times the next statement that will be executed as we debug. And then finally, you don't see a Python prompt, you see a Python debugger prompt that is PDB capitalized in parentheses. And the PDB prompt is simply waiting for you to issue a debugger command, at which point you might be freaking out. You might be saying, I don't, I don't know any Python debugger commands. That's okay. There's only one that you really need to remember, and that's help. <laughs> Just like the Python prompt itself, the interactive prompt, has a help function, the Python debugger has a built-in help command. It's not a function, it's a command. So you don't put parentheses after it to call it. You're in the debugging environment now. We enter debugging commands. So when you enter help, you see a list of all the possible debugger commands. So we try to make Python as self-documenting as possible, even interactively, 
So you don't have to go out to the web and look things up or look things up in a book. If you have Python, all the documentation you need should already be at your fingertips. And it is with the Python debugger as well. So you notice that there's quite a few different commands there for the debugger. And we're going to look at a lot of them. But you might be asking yourself, okay, that's a list of the commands. How would I go about using those commands? Well, once again, help is your friend. Simply pick out a command out of that list that looks like it might do something you're interested in. And the help command, when given names of those commands, debugger commands, will give you help information that you can scroll back and forth through. If it's long output, the F key will go forward and the V key will go back and then we'll return to the Python debugger prompt. So there is a list command that will show you the, out, the source code for the program under debugging. That's your fizzbuzz.py script right now. And it can take optional arguments. We'll take a look at those. You can tell it what line to be listing from. And you can tell it the last line to list. Or you can give it a dot to list around where the current instruction pointer is, where you're debugging, where, which, one, which statement you last stepped through, which one's going to execute next. So there's a long explanation but a very short schematic there at the top of the help information that shows you how to use the list command. It shows you the list command can be abbreviated as L. So it shows you that the first and last lines or the single dot are optional. But it's an either or thing. Either the first and or last first or first and last or dot are acceptable arguments for list. So because you can abbreviate most of these commands with just their first letter, for the most part someone might take two, you can also get the help command with just an H and you can refer to the command you're trying to get help with by its first letter, such as L. So if you entered HL, you're not going to hell, you're getting help on the list command. All right, so the list command. You can be at the PD prompt at any time and say L or list. And it will show you the 11 lines around the current instruction pointer. So the current instruction pointer is placed at the end of the next line to execute. When you started your debugging, you saw it said line 7 instead of line one. Line seven is the end of a multi-line string that starts the first statement of fizzbuzz.py. So it's not an instruction pointer of a line, it's an instruction pointer of a statement. So we're going to execute next the statement ending at line seven, the first statement in the program. So the instruction pointer there is highlighted for you in red. It's where you are as you debug. If you were to give the Python debugger a different line number, such as 16, you would see the 11 lines around line 16 instead of the current instruction pointer and the lines around it. So you see that line and five lines before and five lines after. You kind of have a window into your source code for the script being debugged. All right, if you just, if you keep entering these list commands, it will keep showing you the next 11 lines and continue on for as long as you have program statements. And you might want to know, how do I return to where my instruction pointer is? Well, L and a dot, L space dot, will return you to a listing of your current instruction pointer. That's important to know. If you get lost, you can go back to where you are with L space dot. 
Now, it won't move the instruction pointer. It will show you the listing around your instruction pointer. Any question there about how to list the source of the program being debugged? Great. When you're at the debugger prompt, you can enter arbitrary Python expressions and statements, and they will be evaluated in whatever namespace that your program is currently running in. When you first start the debugger, you're in the interpreter's main namespace. So you can enter a numeric expression, such as 3 raised to the 1 half power, to get this, the square root of 3. If you're in Python 2, though, 1 divided by 2 results in 0. You have integer division in Python 2. In Python 3, dividing two integers results in a floating point number. So you can raise 3 to the 1 half power. If you did that in Python 2, you would see 3 raised to the 0 power, which is 1. All right, so you're in a namespace at all times. You can use the built-in DIR function to look at that namespace. See what identifiers are currently bound in that namespace. And you can use a print statement or a print function if you're in Python 3 to look at the namespace attribute, the special under under name under under to tell you what namespace you're currently executing in. Any questions there about being able to do arbitrary Python at the debugger prompt? This turns out to be incredibly useful because you can take things from that namespace and compute other things with them. You can add to that namespace. You can remove identifiers from that namespace. Now, it turns out that many built-in Python identifiers have the same name as some debugger commands. And you can always guard against this and make sure that you run the Python when you're intending to run the Python by preceding the Python with an exclamation bang. So bang list, instead of listing the 11 lines around your current instruction pointer, will get you a reference to Python's built-in list type object. So any questions? About, about see a hand go up back there? Great. So you're following along. This is a follow-along exercise. And why can't we learn by doing? All right. So to continue about what debugging is, that's executing a program one statement at a time. That's in red because that's the fundamental process of debugging. Execute a statement. Inspect the state of your program, the objects bound to identifiers. Your instruction pointer is keep repeating that process until you zero in on where the problem is. It's a process of elimination. So the way that we step through a Python program, one statement at a time, step through a statement is S. That will be the debugger command to execute the statement at the instruction pointer. The next statement to be executed. So when you do that, Python will take that multi-line string and create the doc string for the module out of it and bind it to the module's doc string attribute. The debugger will show you the next statement to be executed, which is the implement in the fizzbuzz.py program. It will show you this in line nine of the fizzbuzz module. It will show you the complete path to that module. It will show you the last thing that was evaluated was a module object. The doc string actually wasn't bound to an identifier except the doc, special doc string attribute, so that is not shown to you there. The string was evaluated. So you step through one program and it had an effect on your namespace. Let's list, use the list command L to see that the instruction pointer moved. So you move from one statement to the next, one at a time. And you modified your namespace. If you look at it with a DIR, built-in command with no arguments, that's your current namespace. You will see you have added an under, under doc, under, under attribute, a doc string 
for your module. If you have an unbound string at the top of your module, then it will be bound to the doc string attribute of your module. So then we can use a print statement or function to look at that, render that doc string, because it's a multi-line string, look better visually render it with the print. And because the Python debugger has its own built-in print command, we can use the exclamation point to disambiguate the fact that we'd like to use the Python print statement or command to look at the value of the doc string of the module. And you'll see how this module is documented at the module level. Generate the first in FizzBuzz answers. And there's a usage string there that shows you you can invoke the Python interpreter with FizzBuzz as the name of a script or a patch of the script and a command line argument that we did not supply when we started the debugger. That's okay. We can use the Python debugger to learn things about what happens when we don't supply that argument. That de argument is normally expressed as in in this usage string. We normally supply a number there of how many FizzBuzz answers we want because the doc string says generate the first in FizzBuzz answers. All right, is everybody at this, anybody not at this point? I should ask if there's anyone in the room who's not at this point. Okay, just type um, uh, R to return. Is that getting you through that? Interesting. Thank you. Anybody else experience that? Okay, R should get you through returning from the future module. Yeah, if you accidentally step into a function that you don't want to step all the way through, R means return. Do all that stuff in return. We're going to look at that again a little bit later. So I developed all this in Python 3 and didn't have a from future import print um, function statement when I was developing this. And Python 2 was a little bit of an afterthought because I just taught a class in Python 2. So now is everybody at this point? Great. Sorry to throw you off a little bit there. Happens in tutorials. <laughs> Gotta keep everybody in the same spot. It's difficult to do when everybody's using something different. All right, so the next statement to execute is that import statement. So if we step through that, then Python will import the sys module, bind it to the sys attribute in our current namespace. And you should see the instruction pointer at the start of the definition of a fizzbuzz function that takes a single argument in. The debugger will tell you that that statement is at line 11 of the fizzbuzz.py module. So then you can use the built-in dir command with no argument to look at your current namespace. And you see that the sys identifier has been added to your current namespace. So our program is functioning as we might expect. The sys identifier in our current namespace is bound to the sys module object. Use the list command to have a look and see that your instruction pointer has indeed moved. You can always get a picture of where you are there with the list command. If you've wandered off somewhere else by listing too many statements, you can use list space dot to get back to where the current instruction pointer is. Hope this concept of instruction pointer is clear. Great. If I did the list command again there, I could look at the rest of the source code of that function. Fairly simple function. If you're in this class, learn debugging. I don't expect all these statements to make sense to you. If you're in PyCamp, certainly they do make sense to you. So you can look ahead and see what's ahead when you're debugging your program and kind of plan accordingly. Yeah, I want to step through that and that and that. And I think when I get to this point, I want to be expect, um, inspecting maybe um, the state of what object is bound to the identifier answer. 
or maybe answers. Get back to where your instruction pointer is with L space dot. So you can see where you are. Remember where you are. Yes, sir. Is this all on um, Python 2? You're on 3 and you're on Windows and you're getting that problem? It's a new one. You're on Mac and you're getting that problem. So that's like a period dot. If you're typing at a keyboard, try list dot. If list dot doesn't work, try list 11. List space 11. Okay, so yours is pointing at line 10. Don't know what to do about that right now. Okay, yes, in 2.7, you have an extra line in your program, that, that import statement. Okay, so you might should be at line 12. Your instruction pointer should be on the fizzbuzz function definition. Great, moving right along. Let's step through that function definition. A function definition is a single compound statement in Python. It doesn't execute all the statements in the function. It makes a new function object and binds it to the name of the function, fizzbuzz. So Python considers that a compound statement that makes a function object. So that function object is created and bound to fizzbuzz. Now the statements in the function are executed. So stepping takes you way ahead in your file to line 28 or 29 from Python 2. And now the function object is defined. You're at the if special name equivalent to special main string. Line your program. You can use the built-in DIR function to inspect the state of your namespace and you'll see that fizzbuzz as an identifier has been added to your namespace it's bound to the function object that you just saw defined. And you're back at your debugger prompt now. Is that pretty cool? So one statement, function definition. You can just step right, if, as long as you're not calling the function, you're just defining it, you can step right over that definition. I think it's done all in one step. It is a statement. So now you can use L to look at the instruction pointer and the statements around it. A very different place in your program. If that's where you expect it to be, that's good. If you didn't expect to be there, you might start looking at your code and questioning, how did I get this beautiful house? How did I get this beautiful instruction pointer? All right, any questions? Let's just step through that a little bit at a time. If you have S, you'll go there to that first try statement because you are in your main namespace. And so the name special attribute is already bound to the main special string. That means execute all the statements inside the conditional, the first of which a try, try statement header. So we're there at the try keyword. Let's step past that with an S. The next line there in that script body is testing if we have exactly two command line arguments. Now that's relative to the script Python, excuse me, the executable Python. Normally we run our script when we supply an argument to it. So we would have, uh, if we properly run fizzbuzz with a number, we'd have two command line arguments after Python. We have the script name, and we would have how many fizzbuzz numbers we'd want. And so the length of sys.argv, the list in the sys module that contains the command line tokens would have a length of two. 
All right, so that is probably not going to be true. It's going to be something other than two because we didn't supply the proper arguments when we started FizzBuzz. So if we step there, we go inside that conditional because we have a number of arguments other than two. And inside that conditional, we purposely raise an exception with the raise keyword. We raise a value error exception. We instantiate an instance of the value error class and provide a message for our exception object, incorrect number of arguments. Okay, so we're about to, to purposely cause an exception, which will normally end a Python program. We're in the debugger. We can do things and get away with it. So if we enter S now, we are going to raise the exception and see how the debugger handles that for us. First, it will show us that the exception has been raised and what the message is. It doesn't need to show us a traceback object like you get in the Python debugger because we already know what module we're in, what line number we're at. We want to see what happened when we executed it. So it simply shows that it has been raised. And it shows us that the instruction pointer is still there on that statement where we raise the exception. All right, if we hit S again, we're in a try accept block, right? So Python should now skip to the exception handler. If we hit S again, and indeed, we pop down there to the accept, the accept keyword in our exception handler. And we can step through the statements in our exception handler with another S. And our FizzBuzz pro, um, program does something very reasonable that many Python programs will do. If you don't enter the correct number of command line arguments, print the doc string for the module, which should have some documentation about how to run the script, telling you how many arguments you need. So we're about to print, we're about to call, if you're in Python 3, call the print function. This may work differently for you in Python 2, but we're about to call a function. If we step through it, we will see the doc string printed. You'll see all the program output in the debugger. You'll see the program output in the debugger. So that doc string is printed out. And then you see a line called return. It's showing you the return from the print statement, print function, excuse me. And then it also shows you you're back at line 35, the print function in your module. The instruction pointer is not moved. However, the Python debugger shows you what value was returned by that print function, which is none. The print function sends some stuff to the console, but actually returns none. What happens if we keep stepping? If we keep stepping, we're actually going to return from our module object. Python keeps track of the fact that we've loaded a module, the FizzBuzz module. We can actually return from that because it's running actually under the debugger. The debugger has loaded and is running that for us. When we hit that next X, S, we're actually returning from our program. If you list at this point, you will see in the file. It's ready to return from this module because it's reaching the end of the file of the module. So if we hit S again, we're actually stepping back into the debugger. The debugger has a runner. It tells us we're now 
in the bdb.py module. BDB is basic debugger. It's a module that's used by Python's debugger, PDB. PDB imports BDB and has a lot of functions to help you build your own debugger. The Python built-in PDB debugger is only one possible debugger. It's a very simple debugger that Python gives you with Python. But it's built on top of another basic debugger module that you can embed in your own Python IDEs. And most other Python IDEs do use that module to do their debugging. They just show you the output in a different way, maybe in a graphical user interface. So these concepts that you're learning here apply to pretty much all Python debuggers. If you have Wing or Spider or PyDev and Eclipse, this is probably what's going on. Yes, Angela. Could be. Okay, that's okay. You may not see exactly the same thing because you may be using a slightly different Python. But you'll be seeing we're in. Yours will not tell you that the BDB module is at the same place as mine is because that's the place where it's installed on my machine. All right, if you're in that BDB module, you can hit S, and that's actually the end of the runner in the BDB module. The BDB module ends, and when it ends, the Python PDB module reloads your program so that you can step through it again. You can go through it again and again and again. You come to the end, just wraps right around, and it will run it again. So you have to hit S to restart it. It will say the program is finished and will be restarted, and restarts it again right there with the instruction pointer on line 10, getting ready to evaluate the doc string. Look at what else the debugger did for you. If you look at the current namespace, it also reset the current namespace for you. So you're all ready to debug from scratch again. And that's exactly what we're going to do because we're going to learn some more debugging commands. We're going to step through this way. So is everybody able to get back to where you're ready to step through the program again? Does Python 2 do that for you? Gets you back and restart it. Great. Wunderbar. Wunderbar. Okay. There's a way you can get out of the Python debugger, though. If you're finished debugging, Q will help you quit and go back to your operating system problem. There are ways we can run the debugger from within Python. And Q will get you back to your Python problem. Yes, sir. Um, if you're in the debugger, run the program, it ends the debugger. The debugger is actually running your program, so you've ended the thing running your program. Okay, you're back at your operating system point at this point. Q for quit. That means we can now run the debugger again with Python-M. Tell the debugger you'd like to debug fizzbuzz.py, but this time... Let's supply the FizzBuzz program with a numeric argument to generate some answers to the FizzBuzz game. Give an argument of 100. Let's get answers to the FizzBuzz game. We'd like to cheat at FizzBuzz. We're going to start memorizing the sequence of FizzBuzz answers. So that gets you, again, like before, ready to run the first statement in the program, which is actually an unbound expression, the doc string assignment. You can use L, just like before. Assure yourself visually of where you are and where you're going. In fact, you can just keep listing your program all the way to the end with successive L's. Every listing starts where the last one left off. 
And you see that offending line down there at line 30 before? That's where we messed up before. Often, what we'll do is we'll try to run the program. We'll find where it messed up. We'll start the debugger over. Maybe we need to quit and start the debugger over and provide command line arguments and try to make the program work properly. But we know that's where the problem occurred before. It would be really nice if we didn't have to single step and repeat all that stuff just to get to this point. We already know where the problem is. We're going to set a breakpoint. We're going to let the debugger run all the statements in the program until it reaches a particular place in the program that we specify by line number. So the B debugger command will set a breakpoint, and we need to tell it where to set it. Let's set it at line 30 if you're in Python 3, if you're in Python 2. After you do that listing, find where this particular line is in the program is and what line number it's at. For me, it's line 30. And set a breakpoint there. One step of a breakpoint is, instead of single-stepping through the program, run through all the steps in the program that it takes to get to that point and stop the debugger. Go to the debugger prompt. It doesn't do it immediately. You're setting a breakpoint for later use. So now if you list the statements around line 30, 31, wherever you have this breakpoint set, you will see that the listing, the debugger listing, shows a B in front of lines with breakpoints. You can have more than one sequentially in the order that you set them. So this is actually breakpoint one. We'll see how to get a listing of all our breakpoints in a little bit. So use L space dot or wherever your instruction pointer is to get back to where you're about to start executing statements in your program if you're going to single step. It's bizarre that it doesn't work in Windows because it's the official Python way of doing it is L space dot. And your help information should have told you that. So you may have some broken Python going on. If you have that problem, let me look at it with you after class. I'd like to know what's going on. All right, so the C debugger command means instead of single step, continue execution until the next breakpoint. And so the debugger stop at line 30. It will show you the step that it stopped at, which would be executed next if you were going single step. If you do a listing, you will see the breakpoint and you will see the instruction pointer at the breakpoint. Any question there about continuing execution to the breakpoint? We've learned C, we've learned B, and we've learned S and L. Just a few debugger commands. And we're starting to get very powerful techniques that go way beyond what we can do with print statements. All right, so if we're at that point, the idea is to inspect the state of our namespace. See if our program is proceeding as we think it ought to, if it, if it goes to the statements we think it ought to, and if it's binding the identifiers we think it ought to be binding. We can use arbitrary Python expression on these identifiers so we can use Python algebra to, to look at them. So look at how many command line arguments you have now. So this is telling you a few things. This is telling you that running the debugger with Python dash MPDB is not affecting how many command line arguments are being bound to sys.rv. They're simply be bound, being bound to the script name, fizzbuzz.py, and the first argument after it. Does anyone have a length of sys.argument other than two? Because we need this 
to skip that next conditional where the value error exception will be raised. A custom exception will be raised. We don't want to raise it. We want to see how this program should run. If you have that, then you can type S and you will skip over all the statements of the conditional and arrive at statement 32, at line 32, where we're going to call the fizzbuzz function. We're going to call it with the second command line argument converted to an integer. It's going to return to us a list of strings that will bind to the identifier answers. So a lot goes on in that line of code. If we hit S there, we see something new. We hit S and we see call. We're calling a function. Instead of debugger telling you you're returning, it's telling you you're calling. We're going to be able to single step through this function. If you do L, you see the instruction pointer has moved to your function definition header. We're going to start executing the function. Before we do, we can examine the or see what they're bound to. There's a built-in P for print. It's a deeper command for evaluating a Python expression and printing the value of it. So I can say P space N. Now it will evaluate the parameter N and show me the value bound to it. This buzz function is being called with the argument of 10 being bound to the parameter n. Excuse me, 100 bound to n. So let's single step through that function. You hit s one time, proceed to the first statement, pass the, the function definition header, where we bind an, an empty list to answers. Press s again. You go to the for loop header, press S again, you proceed into the side, inside the for loop. Along the way, we could be inspecting what is bound to answers, what's bound to X as we proceed around the for loop. You can also at any time use L to see yourself run around this for loop. It's going to run around there 100 times. You can step through as many of those 100 times as you'd like. It could take you quite a while to do that. Sometimes you have to think about your debugging process. Do I have all day to run around this 100 times? Is there any reason to suspect that the first or second time would be any different from the 80th or the 90th time? At any time, you can inspect the namespace. If you're inside a function, the function has a local namespace. So if you do a DIR with no argument, you will see the local namespace, which has the parameter in, the parameters of a function belong in the function's local namespace, and all the, all the identifiers bound up until that point inside the function. So now let's look, let's talk about namespaces while we're debugging for a little bit. We were in the, inside the main module namespace. Now we're executing inside the function, so we're in the function's namespace. Different namespaces. The debugger has a command called where that will show the stack. The stack of namespaces that will have an effect at this point. It shows you at the very bottom where your instruction pointer is. The next statement to be executed will be binding the identifier answer to an empty string. Right above that, it tells you that's at line 18 in the fizzbuzz function of the fizzbuzz module. You see a little greater than sign pointing at that. That taken together is considered a stack frame. In Python, you will frequently hear developers in Python talk about the stack and the stack frame. This is what we're talking about, the stack of namespaces that are in effect at any given time. Right above that, we got 
to this point in the FizzBuzz function from line 32 in the FizzBuzz module where we executed answers equals the calls to FizzBuzz. So that's how we got into this function. Do we got there by running the debugger. The debugger's namespace is also in effect. So our namespace is kind of stacked up. Three stack frames there. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to get to the identifiers and namespaces we came from? If I try to evaluate, um, say what sys.argv is now, I would probably be able to get that because the the global identifiers are available to the local namespace. However, there may be identifiers in other namespaces it might be more difficult to get to. Here's what the debugger provides us. The up command will cause your namespace scope to move up one in the stack frame. And we'll show you that visually, which stack frame is currently in effect. The one where line 32 in your program is. Now if you use the dir function to look at your current namespace, it will show you the global namespace instead, where the fizzbuzz function is defined, where the sys module is imported, where the module doc string is. That doc string will be different in the outer namespace of the module than the inner namespace of the function. You can go back down, back into the function namespace with the down debugger command. And if you enter it too many times, don't worry. The debugger will simply tell you that you're at the most recent frame, the newest frame, if you enter down too many times. Any question about moving up and down the stack frame to be able to inspect the state of the program? and all the various levels of namespaces in your stack. Great. Yes, sir. If you happen to be at another frame and you have a same list variable name, when you're in that other frame, you're looking at the mm -hmm. So now when you inspect it, you'll be looking at that namespace. That's, that's one of the great purposes of this. Great. So now... Use L for listing, and even though we moved around namespaces, our instruction pointer is still ready to do the next statement inside the for loop of the fizzbuzz function. We can simply continue, and Python will buzz right along, executing statements, return from the function, looking for a breakpoint. But there are no more breakpoints in our program. We, we got to the one at line 30, we went beyond it. So the program will go all the way to the end. It'll go to that last statement. We'll see the end of file. It'll return to the debugger, the BDB module. The runner will end. The PDB module will restart the program in the, in the debugger. We're ready to run yet again. We can keep doing this process over and over until we enter Q at a debugger prompt to quit. Now remember I told you we could look and find out where all our breakpoints are. Sometimes we set them and we need to be able to find out what they were and do other things to them. The B command, debugger command, without any arguments will tell you where all your breakpoints are set. All the breakpoints have a sequence number. We'll tell you what the sequence number is in the first column and what kind of breakpoint it is. There are different kinds of breakpoints. We'll tell you whether it's displayable. It will tell you if it's enabled. We can turn them on and off. We can tell you what line is at in your program. And it will tell you a very valuable piece of information. How many times you've hit that breakpoint. How many times have you gone past it? You can go past it multiple times, and the debugger will stop every time it gets to the breakpoint. So you can put one in a for loop to stop your for loop. You can just hit continue, come back around the breakpoint, hit continue, come back around to it, 
and have an opportunity in the debugger prompt to do something every time you run around a for loop or an indefinite while loop. So I can hit the C command again to start running, and I'll come to my breakpoint. Again, it has not been cleared by restarting the program in the debugger. The debugger did restart my program, including my global namespace got reset. However, the breakpoints did not get cleared out. They're still in effect until I do something about them or in the debugger session. So now I can start single stepping again from line 30. I know I have two command line arguments, so I'm not going to execute the conditional. Sys.argv is still bound to the command line that I originally invoked the debugger and the script with. So now I'm ready to run the function again. Got to that point, instead of walking through all the statements of the function, in or next will step over the function, execute all the statements in it, return with a value, and proceed to the next statement in the program. So I don't have to single step through my functions. If I know they're behaving correctly, I satisfy myself that FizzBuzz is working properly, the FizzBuzz function, let's just use in to step right over it. And then the identifier answers in the global namespace will be bound to a list of strings. There's a built-in PP debugger command that will use Python's pretty print or pprint module. There's a pprint function in the pprint module that takes complex or long Python objects and prints them out in a somewhat readable fashion. If you have a very long list, it will print out all the elements on a single line instead of one long line. So we can pretty print the answers and see that the FizzBuzz function returned us a list of answers, first 100 answers, to the FizzBuzz game. In fact, that next statement that we're going to execute will actually join up a string version of all those elements separated by a single space and rent the, uh, print the resulting string, render it to the console. So when we execute it, we see all those answers. Those are all the correct first 100 answers to the FizzBuzz game. And you can see the numbers divisible by three are substituted with Fizz, the numbers divisible by five substituted with Buzz, the ones divisible by 15 substituted with FizzBuzz or should be working like that, I think it is. You can verify that. Of course, because we hit C and there are no more breakpoints, the program ended and the debugger has restarted back at the doc string. Is there ever going to be any end to this? Well, when we learn all the debugger commands, there will be, I promise. Either that or four o'clock gets here. All right. So if we're at that point, we can continue right back to our breakpoint and use the B command to see this is the third time we've hit that breakpoint. Python does some important bookkeeping for you. We'll be able to use the number of times the breakpoint has been hit. And if I step over to get to the call to FizzBuzz, I'll be ready to do the next step, which is instead of using in to step over the function, let's step back into it. And step down there about three times through the function to get there to the line where we bind the identifier answer to an empty string. That's kind of where we were before. We could be getting ready to do a lot of tedious debugging inside this function that we already know that works. So if you accidentally start single stepping and get stuck inside there in a function and you don't want to continue running to the next breakpoint when you don't have one set, 
you just wish that you had done N instead of S. Happens a lot. We're all human. R will go to the end of the function, return, return its value, and stop at the next statement after the call of the function. So it'll show you it's back at line 26. It will also show you the FISBOS function has been called and its return value. Looky there, there's the answer. Return from the FISBOS function. And for how many people in the room is that answer not an abbreviated version of the answer? You might see three dots there instead of the entire list. Okay, everybody got three dots. That's great. So it's showing you there, you're at the return statement, ready to return that value. So you can keep on going and do the return statement. Come back to your program where the print statement is. We can call the print statement with S. Except look at that print, print function there, that print statement. It has a list comprehension in it. That can be difficult to deal with in the debugger because the debugger is actually going to run around that list comprehensions for claws. So we just keep hitting S and we're going to run around that list comprehension 100 times. That would be rather tedious. In fact, the debugger is telling you, you're in a list comprehension. You're stuck in the twilight zone. That's kind of annoying. I know on at least Python 3, the R command works for list comprehensions, gets you out of trouble just like it does inside functions. It will complete the list comprehension, tell you it's ready to return from it, show you the, the um, Python object the list comprehension evaluated to which before was a list of integers and strings, and now it's all strings, ready to join up and print out. And you're also ready to execute the rest of the print statement. So it takes a couple of S's to get just through that print statement. If you're stepping, single stepping, you're gonna step in that list comprehension, whoo, then you gotta get out of it, or then you actually gotta do the print by stepping again. All right, those are pretty much the stepping commands to be able to single step, continue, and return, and do a next through an entire function at one time. There is an, you can get help on what's called a clear command, the clear or CL command will enable you with a Space separated list of breakpoint numbers, those, those numbers the breakpoints are enumerated with in the break command. So we only have one set. There's, there's breakpoint one. You can specify a breakpoint number to clear so that it is no longer in effect. You can erase the breakpoint with a clear command. I'm just going to go through a few of the debugger commands rather than having you do each of them because you can get help on them at any time here. There's a disable command where you do not get rid of a breakpoint, you just kind of temporarily turn it off. If you remember when you listed the breakpoints, one of the columns was enabled or disabled. So you can turn the breakpoints on and off and turn them back on at a later time without having to remember where they're set. It also preserves that count of the number of times the breakpoint has been hit. There's also an enable command, this the partner of disable. Once you turn a breakpoint off, you can turn it back on by number. Turn breakpoint one back on. Any question there? There's whether So one of the things a breakpoint can do 
is display the value of an exception. Or actually, the debugger will display exceptions. Um, excuse me, dis display expressions. So you can display an expression with a display command, D. Display the value of an expression if it changed. So this is an important part of debuggers. Is if you have an IDE, it's called the watch window. You'll have a window where you can have a number of expressions. They're usually just Python identifiers. And in the execution of your program, if those identifiers or expressions change, get bound to some other value, become some other value, you see them change in the watch window. Well, the same thing happens in the basic console window with display. You can say display answers. And any time what is bound to answers in the namespace that you identified there in the display command, then you'll see a printout of it there on the console. So as you step through, you may see, you may be informed of changes to answers. So you see there's things you might want to play with here. You can make a breakpoint conditional. You can set a breakpoint like breakpoint one and then make it conditional. There's some expression that's going to evaluate to true or false and the breakpoint will only break if when program execution gets to the breakpoint and that condition is true. So set a breakpoint in your for loop but maybe set a condition on it. Don't break until x is greater than 50. And it will loop around 50 times before breaking. That's also in your breakpoint display list. It'll tell you it's a conditional breakpoint and what the condition is. You can tell a breakpoint to be ignored. Actually, you can ignore the count on a breakpoint. So if you emit that, you can reset the breakpoint counter back to zero. The breakpoint becomes active when the ignore count is zero. You can create your own commands in the debugger with this alias command. Alias will first take a name of what you want to type and make your new name, name your new command name. Then we'll take some existing command with some parameters. So you might have a, a command BP30, which is alias to setting the breakpoint on line 30. Or maybe a command BC50, which is a conditional on a breakpoint to have a count of 50 before breaking. So you can, if you're going to do long involved um, debugging sessions where you're typing the same things over and over again, you can make aliases for them. Finally, there's a temporary break you can set on a line number, and it will break only one time and then be cleared. It's a one-time break point. So you execute your entire program one step at a time in the debugging process, or you can simply execute only the suspect portions of your program. There's no need to run the whole thing in the debugger if you have some suspicions about where your problem is going to be. That allows you to isolate suspected portions of your program faster. Let's see how we go about doing that. We have a new version of FizzBuzz in your folder called FizzBuzz NG. And FizzBuzz NG has an extra line added in it before the raise statement that we'll execute if we don't supply the proper number of arguments on the command line. And it's actually a two statement line that uses a semicolon. The semicolon is rarely used in Python to end a statement. You normally use it on the command line if you're invoking Python with the dash C option to run a Python statement at the command line. You can make a 
multi-statement command line with the semicolon at the end of each statement. The next most common way of it being used would be this particular Python idiom right here. Import the PDB module and then call it set trace function. And at that point, the set trace function will cause your program to dump into the debugger at that point. So you can just put it into a normal Python script and norm run it with Python as you would normally, not with the dash M PDB switch. Just run Python fizzbuzzng.py. And the program will run along in perfectly normal Python fashion. Won't even be aware the debugger's there until you import it and run the Python debugger set trace function, which dumps your program into the debugger at that point, the instruction pointer will be set at the next line. So let's try that out. And back at your command line, use Python to run fizzbuzzng next generation. This is often something you often, some sort of um, naming convention you often see in um, the Python community and other communities I find especially annoying. The next version of a program is being called NG for next generation. All right, so when you do that, Fizzbuzz NG will run until it imports the PDB module and set trace dumps it into the debugger and you see the Python debugger prompt. And you also see that you're in line 32 of the program. Your line might be slightly different from mine, depending on which version of FizzBuzz you're running. Okay. So we're right here at this problem point. We have not supplied a command line argument to FizzBuzz. So we're at that point there where we're about to raise a value error exception, and so we can check that out. We can do whatever debugging we need to do there. Okay, go back out, quit your debugger, quit Python, go back to your operating system prompt. Not only can we put, dump, the Python, um, dump our Python program out into a, into a debugger by inserting that set trace in there, we may not know ahead of time where we're gonna have a problem. So here is a FizzBuzz, a version of the FizzBuzz program called FizzBuzz NG2, Next Generation 2. An annoying naming convention there. And we're going to run Python with a switch called dash I for interactive. How many people have not used the dash I switch to run Python before? Don't be afraid, raise your hand. Great, most people in the room you don't learn about Python debugging, you'll learn about this really cool thing Python can do. Dash I. So what Fizzbuzz NG does is the same old Fizzbuzz program, except it does not run that if special name is equivalent to special main clause and a try except handler. So it's going to raise a value error exception that is not handled. That will normally stop your Python program. Okay, the dash I switch for Python will say run a Python script, and when the script is done, don't dump me back at the command line prompt, dump me to a Python prompt in the name, main namespace. So you can sit there and after your program's run, evaluate expressions in your main namespace, your Python interpreter's main namespace. If a traceback happens to be raised, you'll be dumped back at the Python prompt when the exception is raised. It's the same as ending your program with a traceback. Instead of going back to the command prompt, you go back to a Python prompt. This is what you do if you don't know where the exception is going to be raised ahead of time. Then that Python prompt, you can do what's called postmortem debugging. 
So import the PDB module and use a semicolon to own the same line from the PDB module's namespace, run its built-in PM or post-mortem function, which will then dump you into the Python debugger at the point where the exception was raised, and you can go nuts with the Python debugger looking at the namespace. It'll probably help you out a whole lot. How many people do Django? Few people, how many people do Plone? Most of your Python web frameworks have some kind of tool that will do this. Run my web framework until an exception is raised and dump me out in a debugger prompt and have all my web framework tools available to me to help me look around. Any question there about the postmortem function? of the Python debugger module? Great. So the Python debugger module has a built-in function called run. That's normally what runs your script, but you don't have to start the running until you're already in Python, and you don't have to run an entire Python script. You can run particular Python expressions inside the Python interpreter with PDB's run function. So if you're doing post-mortem debugging back here, use Q to get out of the Python debugger. You may have to get out of Python itself because you're in interactive mode with Python. But then get back into a fresh Python debugger. And if you're in the same directory, executing Python in the same directory with your fizzbuzz.py, Normally, most people have a sys.path that's set up to allow you to import Python scripts and modules from the current working directory. So you should be able to import fizzbuzz even though you don't have it installed in your site packages. Once you import fizzbuzz, you now have a fizzbuzz namespace in the Python interpreter's main namespace. All the attributes of the FizzBuzz module are available through the FizzBuzz module object bound to the identifier FizzBuzz. You can import the Python debugger now as well because you would like to look in the Python debugger's namespace and get its run function and call it by putting parentheses after it. The run function of the Python debugger module expects a string argument. So you have to give it a string of some Python expression that can be evaluated in your current namespace. My current namespace has an identifier fizzbuzz available for the fizzbuzz module. The dot operator will access the fizzbuzz function in it, which will allow me to call it by putting parentheses after it with an argument. So don't forget to make that a string. Run evaluates a Python string under the Python debugger. So I'll start the Python debugger and tell you it just evaluated a string. But within that, that particular namespace that was created there, you can single step to call that function in the string. The first line in the string is a function call. So S will then step into the fizzbuzz function. And you can list its source code and do all the normal things that you would do with the fizzbuzz function from the main namespace. So any questions? Yes, sir. When we were printing the uh, variables, like, did we print um, all of the variables, like all the locals? With the locals built in, yes, if you're in a local namespace. You have to, you have, to have access to the namespace from where you are in the Python interpreter. It's all about where you are in the stack frame. You have to have, things have to be in scope. Yes, sir. So if, is there a possibility through the debugging that you could possibly like, change the value of a variable inadvertently? Oh, you, you, often, you often want to do that. Okay. You know, I might be looping through something. The loop control identifier um, hasn't gotten very far along yet, and I might rebind it to something else to help move things along. 
You can also do really dangerous stuff like that. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am? I'll repeat the question. The question was, um, if I'm in the debugger, can I rebind the identifiers in my namespace and change how my program is running? The answer is yes. You often want to do that. You often want to test, well, what if my program were doing this instead? What would happen? It's actually a valid way to prototype some things. What we do with Python programming often is instead of writing an entire program first, we prototype small pieces of it. The debugger can help you do that. Define a function and run it over and over again with a debugger. Change different pieces of it when you're inside of it. Any other questions? How many people have used a Python debugger and an IDE before? Okay, one person, great. So if you get a Python IDE and it has a debugger built into it, all these principles apply. All these same capabilities will be in your Python IDE debugger and pretty much probably nothing else either. <laughs> you might be tempted to spend a lot of money on a Python IDE, you don't need to. In fact, Kenneth was talking this morning in his talk about the, um, the relative pros and cons of just using a text editor versus using an IDE. Many professional Python programmers don't use an IDE. Python gives you enough tools as it is, and when you get these fancy graphical environments, they're just repackagings of those built-in tools. That's not to say you might not want the convenience of an IDE, and some of these IDEs are very pretty, and these watch windows can be very pretty. It's nice to watch the values kind of like flip around and fly around. Someone will show you the instruction pointer moving around in real time. You can set how fast it moves. Any other questions? Okay, there are also alternative implementations of the Python PDB built-in debugger that work at a console. How many people have used IPython, the Python interpreter on steroids? Okay, you can pip install IPDB. IPDB is like, just like PDB, except all those command line features of IPython, like syntax highlighting and tab completion, they're all available through IPDB. There was another one that was under development until about 2009 called EPDB. But IPDB is really the thing to get if you're interested in some advanced command line features for your debugger. All right. How many people here in the room know more about Python debugging now than when they entered the room? Good, goal met. So I've not got the most, um, I guess, um, endearing sort of um, public personality when I'm trying to teach these things. I'm trying to talk loudly and enunciate and get you to try things out. Um, but if I can help you learn something that's great. Um, that's the conclusion pretty much of this talk. You can email me at this email address about this talk. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Um, you can download these materials again at any time from this URL. And I would highly advise you just to go look at the Python documentation on python.org about the PDB module, even though you can find all this stuff out at um, the PDB prompt with the help built in, there are many programming examples of using PDB on this page. It's a one page piece of documentation that's well worth looking at at least once in your development career. Um, so that's the conclusion of this talk. Um, I'll be glad to come out here and look at your, your, um, your Python if you had some of this broken. And I would like to get all those um, Thumb drives back as well. If you would put them in this little baggie up here at the lectern. That would help me out a lot. I need nine of them back. Thank you very much. <laughs>